Hello on Radio 5, the first of six brand new stories about the world's greatest detective, Sherlock Holmes. The unopened casebook of Sherlock Holmes. Six extraordinary adventures written by John Taylor. With Simon Callow as Sherlock Holmes and Nicky Henson as Dr. John Watson. The first adventure, The Wandering Corpse. During that extraordinary period of my life spent as the companion of Sherlock Holmes, I, Dr. John Watson, recorded a large number of adventures which did not at the time seem suitable for publication, usually because they involved people whose reputation I felt a duty to protect. But years have come and gone, and it is possible for me at last to open the book of secrets and to reveal some most singular adventures. In those early days, shortly after I had taken up lodgings with Holmes at Baker Street, we passed many evenings sitting by the fire in silence, a silence occasionally disturbed by the ripples of an impending adventure. Remarkable. Quite, quite remarkable. Holmes, will you be absorbed in that magazine for much longer? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, no, I should think so. Only sharing lodgings with someone, it seems a pity not to spend a moment now and again in light conversation. Oh, yes, yes, quite, quite. I mean, companionable silence is all very well, but if one has it all the time, it ceases to be companionable. Quite, quite, quite. Oh, Holmes, you really are. Watson. Uh, Watson, I should appreciate your professional opinion. Hmm? You're not sick, I hope. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, no, my dear friend, I should appreciate your professional opinion of this publication. The Journal of Experimental Medicine. I, I have seen it about, I think. What was preoccupying my attention earlier was this, an article by Professor Smallbone. Do you know the fellow? Uh, I cannot say I do. The professor's interest is in something he calls electrical therapy. It seems to consist in attaching the patient to a lot of wires and switches. Here, here look, there's an illustration of the sort of contraption he deals in. Mm, I, I have heard that electric machinery is being used to measure heart contractions. Indeed. Well, this Professor Smallbone makes somewhat wilder claims for his paraphernalia. Listen to this, Watson. A river trout, which had been two hours out of water, when the nerve ends were stimulated with an electric charge, not only began to move its tail, but placed in a water tank, began swimming, and within the hour was taking live worms. <laughs> we went on to achieve an equivalent success with a number of mammals, to wit, a shrew, a mouse, and a rat, each of which had been 30 minutes in a vacuum jar deprived of oxygen. The writer concludes, um, it would not be going too far to say that medicine has taken the first faltering steps in the godlike task of bringing the dead back to life. <laughs> Well, my friend, what do you make of that? Absolutely remarkable. May I see the article? Here. Uh, Dr. Watson. Ah, coffee. Um, it's not the coffee I brought, Doctor. Uh, this arrived a minute ago. It was sent from your previous address. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. I'll bring the coffee presently. Hmm. Time, I think, for a pipe. Will you join me, Watson? What? Good Lord. Good gracious. My dear fellow, what is it? Holmes, this is a quite extraordinary coincidence. This note... It comes from the residence of none other than Professor Horace Smallbone. The man you were just reading about, with the electrical therapy machine. Oh? oh what does it say? Well, I, I invited, say, <laughs> beseeched, to visit the man directly. Um, you would incur my eternal respect and gratitude if you were able to attend immediately. I can say no more in this letter, and I beg you to show it to no one. Yours in desperation, Professor Horace S. Smallbone. Mm. Will you go? Holmes, I must. The man is clearly distressed. The woman, I think you mean. Woman? I believe you'll find, Watson, that the author of this letter is of the female sex. Oh, Holmes, what utter nonsense. Why, you haven't so much as seen the drift of the writing. Sometimes I do believe you make these arcane observations out of a kind of mischief. But surely, Watson, you know me better than that. Now, let me explain. I'm sorry, but I must go and find a cab. I think you will find her quite young and agreeable, but extremely clever. Do be careful, Doctor. Oh, brilliant. And Holmes turned out to be at least partly right. It was indeed a woman who opened the door of Professor Smallbone's house to me, and a pretty one. But she was so genteel and becoming a creature, I saw no reason at all to feel I must be careful of her. Please, have a chair. Oh, thank you. It is the Professor... Dr. Watson, I cannot thank you enough for coming here this evening. Oh. I apologize for the mysterious circumstances, the letter and everything. There are good reasons for all of it. My husband isn't here. I mean, he is here, but I'm afraid he won't be able to... Oh, heavens. My dear young woman, you're quite distraught. Oh, Dr. Watson, the most dreadful thing has happened. Here, a sip or two of this will set you right. 
Professor? Oh, thank you. Horace always spoke of you as the kindest of men. Your husband spoke of me? Oh, you never met him, Dr. Watson, but he knew you. I believe he was some years junior to you when you were studying medicine. Ah. When your name appeared once in some medical paper, Horace said, Oh, with such affection. Dr. John Watson, he said. There's a man to go to if you're ever in a fix. And now I am in a fix, the most terrible fix. So to you I have come. Oh, dear. I shall help in any way I can, Mrs. Smallburn, but you must first tell me the problem. If you will promise not to jump to conclusions, you shall see the problem for yourself. We must... We must go down into the cellar. Please follow me, Dr. Watson. Certainly. It is a deep cellar, Mrs. Smallburn. Go on stairs. It was dug deep to accommodate the laboratory, Doctor. Down here is where my husband worked. We are here now. Good Lord. The creatures in those cages. Specimens, Doctor. My husband, as you may know, experimented with the power of electricity. Watch those lamps. Electrical light. Yes, one of my husband's obsessions. But not anymore. That is he, Doctor. And he is dead. Horace is dead. Good Lord, has he lain here long? Since mid-afternoon. Oh, we'd known it was coming. He's had a heart condition for years. All the strain he put himself under, working on all this. He was a great man, Doctor. You may find this hard to believe, but he was close to discovering the secret of life itself. Of resurrecting the dead. But who will bring him back? Oh, is it possible we can get him upstairs into a bed, Dr. Watson? Yes, Mr. Smallbone, that is the first thing we shall do. There. Now he is at rest. It was terrible to have him lying down there in that ghastly laboratory. I loved him so much. And he me. I see that from the ring he wears. Clarissa, love beyond death. My husband was right, Doctor. You are very kind. I wish I could get the ring off. I would like to keep it, but it's stuck. It, it happens sometimes. But why did you send for me, Mrs. Smallburn? I mean, anyone might have moved the body up here. One of the servants or... <laughs> we have no servants. None? Only a day maid. The noise in the cellar, the animals, all that talk of bringing the dead to life. No one dared stay here. But you're right. I didn't call you just to move the body. I intend to prevail upon your kindness for one last thing. Which is? I want you to examine him, Dr. Watson, and provided you are satisfied that heart failure was the cause of death, write a death certificate to that effect so that he can be decently buried. You see, he has debts, large debts. And the way he was found, people might think he had killed himself. Save me from that scandal, Doctor. And why me? Why not your own physician? The man's a fool. He was pitifully jealous of Horace's work. He could not be trusted with this. You are a determined and persuasive woman. And I shall do what you ask, Mrs. Smallburn. Clarissa, Doctor. I should like you to call me Clarissa. Later that week, the body was buried in the Smallburn family vault. The only mourners at the funeral were Mrs. Smallburn, a distant cousin of hers, and myself. It was a couple of days later, while we were breakfasting at Baker Street, that the opening of another letter started the next strange chapter in the story. <coughs> Incredible. By heavens, it, yet I'm certain, but surely not. Watson, hmm? my dear fellow, for heaven's sake, either refrain from mumbling mysteriously to yourself or have the goodness to tell me what is in that confounded letter. Oh, Holmes, forgive me. It's this small bone business. You know that I attended the funeral on Tuesday. Oh. In order to support Clarissa, yes? Yes. Well, it sounds ludicrous, but this is from a medical colleague, Professor Edward Davy of King's, and I, I don't think it's, it, it is exaggerating things to say that it is the strangest letter I've ever received. Listen. Uh, my dear John, this is a most bizarre, bizarre situation, situation, and, and I, I hope, hope you will not misconceive my reasons for writing, writing to you. I do so in order to guard you against the slings and arrows of London gossip. I spent this morning sitting in Hyde Park reading the Times where I learned of the death of a certain Professor Horace Smallbone from a heart attack at his Hackney home. Your name was mentioned as having attended the funeral. When I had finished reading, I walked to Knightsbridge to purchase some small item at Butler's Pharmacy. There I encountered an astounding phenomenon. Six feet from me, a man was buying shaving soap, a razor and other items. John, I am quite sure of this. 
for I had met the fellow on a number of occasions. That man was none other than Professor Horace Smallbone himself, as large as life. I am fairly sure, however, that he did not see me. My dear friend, I know not what trickery is afoot, but implore you to guard your reputation. I remain, as ever, your loyal friend, Edward Davy. Holmes, what can this portend? I mean, if Davy is correct... Is he likely to be mistaken? Or to deceive? Good Lord, Edward Davy is as honest as the day is long. Yet Professor Smallbone is dead. I examined him myself. I saw his mortal remains laid in the family vault. For goodness sake, the dead don't walk. To be sure, I have heard that a man's hair may continue to grow after his death, but I'm quite certain this must be the first recorded instance of a corpse popping out to purchase a razor. <sighs> Now, in which cemetery was the man laid, as we hope, to rest? In Stoke Newington. But we have no authority to go about ransacking graves. Never mind about the authority. Just one question before I get a cab. Apart from that electrical paraphernalia, was there anything about Professor Smallbone's house which struck you as odd? Mm, no, I don't think so. It's an ordinary house, a little gloomy for my taste, and... Oh! Uh-oh. Uh, too trivial. No, 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 no. Say it, Watson, say it. It was just on the wall of the sitting room. Patches where a couple of pictures have been taken down. Drink up that tea, my friend, and take heart. Hmm? There is no puzzle which does not have its solution. Now let us go and investigate that tomb. Must we shut the door, Holmes? The air in here is not pleasant and I cannot see a thing. I'm afraid we must. In fact, I shall lock it. It was a condition of our borrowing the key that no one should see us here. You heard what Valentine said, a most inordinate request. And so it is. And anyone but you, Holmes, would have been refused outright. A personal family vault with its exclusive key, why, we might be taken for common grave robbers. There. Now we can see a little. Come, Watson, you're a physician. Surely the dead hold no terrors for you. Oh, I'm perfectly at ease in the company of a good, honest corpse that will lie down and stay down. It is the walking variety that I'm not accustomed to. <laughs> well, let us see if the wanderer has returned. Now, there are several coffins here, but I take it this is the one we're interested in. No dust upon it. This one, yes. Hold the lamp, my friend. Hmm. I do feel most uneasy about this. Come, come. We wish the man no evil. Our purpose is quite legitimate. <laughs> Find it here. Good Lord, Holmes. He's gone. Yes. I was not expecting this. So it was Professor Smallbone that Davy saw in the Knightsbridge Pharmacy. Holmes, do you not see the import of this? Uh, yes, Watson. Smell it. Smell what? The, I, there's something in the coffin here. Something slightly slimy. If I can just draw some out with my finger. Here, oh, smell it. Please. Nothing to turn your nose up at, my dear friend. Only soap. Honeysuckle soap. Now, your memory might tell you that you had encountered that aroma somewhere recently. Oh, Holmes, I confess I could... Holmes, someone's coming in. Quickly, replace the lid. I... Now, behind that other coffin. Uh... Clarissa Smallbone. What? She's checking inside the coffin. What is she carrying? Some kind of tool. Look, she's reaching inside. Horace! She's fainted. We must get her out into the sunlight. Yes, indeed. But when she comes to, be sure you say nothing about snooping in this vault. Come on. Uh, it's all right, Clarissa. It's Dr. Watson. Dr. Watson? And this gentleman is my friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Uh, we were in the vicinity and happened to hear you cry out your husband's name. When we rushed into the vault, we found you lying there in a dead faint. He's gone. The body. Horace's body. Yes. We saw that the coffin was empty. What is it? What's going on? It is a mystery. But we'll do our best to sort it out. I give you my word. Doctor, take me home, please. I am so frightened. Having escorted Clarissa Smallbone home, where the day maid agreed to put her to bed, Holmes and I took a cab back to Baker Street. He remained deep in thought for the entire journey, and not until supper was done and he was sat by the window in the best chair, puffing on a fresh pipe, did he breathe a word about the afternoon's events. Well, Watson, what do you make of it all? Surely there is only one possible conclusion. Professor Smallbone had been engaged upon experiments whose aim was to resuscitate unconscious bodies by means of electricity. That method has now been used upon him. You say resuscitate unconscious bodies, Doctor, yet you certified him dead. Was he not dead? 
Well, yes, by all the normal signs and tests. As dead as a Christmas goose, is how I seem to remember you're putting it. Yes, I, I dare say I did. I was quite certain at the time. Then what shakes you from your certainty now? Well, clearly the fact that the fellow's coffin is empty. That he was seen strutting about in Knightsbridge. Yeah, which is most likely? That a man has been brought back from the dead, or that we have overlooked an alternative explanation? The second. And, of course, my first thought was that there must be some deception with Clarissa, a party to it. But you saw her reaction in that tomb. I'm certain that that was genuine. She was not expecting an empty coffin. I agree, and that is indeed a point of great interest. But let us not be shaken from examining the details. Those tools she was carrying, did you take note of them? No, I'm afraid not. Two sets of pliers. What did you wish to do with them once the coffin was open? Why, indeed, did she wish to open it at all? I don't know. No, nor do I yet. It is strange. Uh, a visitor for you, Mr. Holmes. Uh, Mrs. Aubrey. I did say it was a bit late, but... Uh... She seems on the desperate side. Oh, well, if she's desperate, you better show her up then, Mrs. Hudson. The woman who came unexpectedly into our domain that evening was a poignant creature. Perhaps 30 or a little more. Pretty in a careworn way. The very picture of genteel poverty. Her clothes, though clean and neat, were neither new nor fashionable. Yet there was about her a graciousness which made us both pay rapt attention. Uh, is that your taste, Mrs. Aubrey? Well, to be honest, Mr. Holmes, I'm not accustomed to the taste of coffee. Ah, ah. Uh, you've come far? Oh, it's a good step from Hoban. You walked, then? Yes, I walked. And I'd better tell you now, I've little money, so if that disqualifies me from your assistance, I'd be glad if you'd say so. Uh, no, Mrs. Aubrey, let us discuss your problem. I'm sure it will be much more interesting than dull talk about fees. Thank you. Uh, that's good of you. Well, it's my husband, Albert, I've come about. He's a good-hearted man, but he has in the past broken the law and paid for it in prison. That's all in the past now, but of course to the police, a criminal is a criminal for life. That is why when he went missing, I could not go to them for help. Um, he has been missing long? Well, since Saturday morning. He went off to his job and never returned. And his job was? He'd been working for the scientist, Professor Smallbone. Oh, good Lord. As I'm sure you know, Mr. Holmes, the professor died on Saturday night. And to be honest, I'm worried. There'd been arguments between them about wages, particularly. But Albert was becoming suspicious about all sorts of things. Well, just lately, he said to me, I can't tell you any details, Hannah, because I have sworn an oath. But I know something about our professor Smallbone that would shake Hackney down to its golden boots. I understand why you came, I think. You're wondering why your husband disappeared immediately after the professor's death. I'm afraid they may have fought. Perhaps even provoked the professor's heart attack. I I'm wondering whether, in, in fear of the police, he's run off and is in hiding somewhere. But whatever went on in that house on Saturday, I I'm quite certain my husband is no murderer. Mrs. Aubrey, you can rest assured. Professor Smallbone was not murdered. Your husband is, I am certain, innocent of any blame. <laughs> then why hasn't he come home? Do you think he's all right? I cannot give you any definite answers at present. I will be in touch directly this business is settled. Thank you for coming. Mr. Holmes? Mrs. Hudson, would you be so kind as to find a cab to take Mrs. Aubrey back to Hoban? Make sure she leaves her address so that I can remain in touch. Oh, of course, sir. Oh, uh, thank you, Mr. Holmes. It, it is very good of you. Watson, we must go out. Now? But where? Back to the Smallbones house in Hackney. The last piece of our puzzle has just turned up. In the cab to Hackney, my friend sketched out his plan. I was to go alone to the Smallbones and delay whomever I found there until Holmes returned. Dr. Watson? John? Clarissa? John, it is very late. I know, but I, uh, I, I have some information. I mean, there are one or two things I... Uh, May I come in, Clarissa, just for a moment? Very well, if it is important. A very different Clarissa Smallbone answered the door to me that evening. Colder. Her eyes were like little spheres of ice. It was with some reluctance that she showed me into the sitting room. I had imagined that her day maid had gone home, yet I had the impression of someone else being present in the house. And I felt most uneasy. Are you alone, Clarissa? Yes. I could not tolerate company after that business in the vault today. Tomorrow I shall go to the police. It was, I suppose, grave robbers who snatched Horace's body from the tomb? Oh, very likely. I was grateful for your bringing me home today. I had had a dreadful shock. This is the least we could do. I must say, when I thought about it later, I was at a loss to know what you were doing in the cemetery with Mr. Sherlock Holmes. You did not tell me you and he were colleagues. Why should I? We have recently begun to share lodgings, that's all. An astute man, I'm told. A marvellous brain, I should think. Oh, first class. And I know he exhibits that insatiable curiosity which is the engine of so many great minds. 
I suppose he can poke his celebrated aquiline nose wheresoever he likes. You are upset, I think. Upset? I am furious, Dr. Watson. I sent you that first letter in strictest confidence. In particular, I asked you to tell no one of my husband's tragic death. Now Mr. Sherlock Holmes appears to be privy to everything, and you are hiding things from me. Hiding things? But not for long. No, don't turn round. I have a gun trained on you, Doctor. May I not know who you are, sir? You are familiar with the way to the cellar, I believe. Please make your way there now. Clarissa! Don't call me that, Dr. Watson, please. I really can't bear it. Of course, you know my laboratory well, Dr. Watson. If you are Professor Smallbone. Secure his hands, Clarissa. Yes. One to each of the two manacles. As you see, Doctor, I am an ardent disciple of Mr. Faraday, that oh. genius of electricity. A fortune is invested here. Steam generator, dynamo electric machine, rotary transformers, cables, solenoids, insulations. This miracle of science has cost me my inheritance and my life savings. And before I have even had a chance to complete my work, I am beset by little men who wish to destroy me. I don't wish to destroy you, Professor. He's secure, Horace. Apply the copper terminals to his wrists. Yes. Terminals? That's right, Doctor. The electric current flows through the copper wires to the positive terminal and completes its circuit by passing through your body and back to the negative terminal on the other side. You would kill me. Oh, I will, sir. I will. Unless you tell me everything you know. I know nothing. Except that a body has disappeared from the Smallburn family vault in Stoke Newington Cemetery. No! Oh, for pity's sake, what are you doing? Trying to get to the truth, Doctor. Now, I'll ask you again. I know that Professor Smallburn has been seen after his death in a shop in Knightsbridge. I say, Professor Smallburn, it may have been his double. His double? Is that what Holmes thinks? I don't know what Holmes thinks. He doesn't always confide in Come me. Come along, Doctor Watson. There's more. No, nothing more. I swear. No! Oh, no! Oh. Well... The, the only other thing... Yes? The only other thing is the, the missing man. Um, Albert Aubrey. The question of what happened to him. And what did happen to him? What does Mr. Holmes think happened to him? I don't know. Come along, come along. Please, how can you expect me to know Holmes's mind? A larger dose, Clarissa. Yes. No! Why not ask me yourself, <laughs> Professor Smallford? Holmes! Forgive me for leaving you in the hands of these monsters, Watson. I had to clear up one or two things and to inform the police of their intentions to escape. Where are these police? Surrounding the house. You are trapped, I'm afraid. Look over your shoulder, Watson, and encounter the face of your torturer. This is Professor Smallbone? Yes, Watson. The man you found dead in this laboratory was Albert Aubrey, the husband of that poor woman who came to visit us today. They murdered him using the machine to which you are now attached, which no doubt simulates very exactly the symptoms of a heart attack. Why should I kill a useless fool like Aubrey? Because, Professor, he knew that your experiments to revive the dead were a total failure. Even that magazine article was a fraud. And when Aubrey threatened to tell the world as much, you cold-bloodedly dispatched him. Then you hit upon the idea of using the murdered man's body to your advantage. If it could be passed off as your own and properly buried, you, as far as the world was concerned, would be dead, thereby exempting you from your excessive death. Dr. Watson's role was to provide the death certificate. But if he was active about town, he might be recognized. Precisely, which is why he decided to remove that rather distinctive black beard and stupidly was spotted in the pharmacy. But, Professor, you knew that you had been seen. Alarmed that the tomb might be investigated, you went there and removed Aubrey's body from the coffin. Your wife did not know you had done this, so when she returned to the tomb herself, she was genuinely horrified to find the coffin empty. But it was her husband's name she called out. Yes, that puzzled me too, but think, what is more natural for a person in shock than to call out the name of a beloved? Why was she at the tomb, though, if not to visit a deceased husband? You remember you mentioned, Watson, that the body you examined wore a tight-fitting wedding ring. Well, it was, of course, her husband's ring. She put it on the corpse to convince you that the body was Professor Smallbone's. But with the fingers swelling after death, it became stuck. She had tried using soap, that honeysuckle concoction in the coffin, but failed. She had returned for another attempt this afternoon when she interrupted us in the vault. This time with two pairs of pliers. A pair to hold the finger, another to draw off the ring. But where is the corpse now? How far could the professor carry it on his own? I am certain he only moved it from one coffin into another. You will find the unfortunate Aubrey sharing a box in that vault with another corpse. I am not going to let you arrest us, Holmes. If you force me to, I'll kill you and Watson both. Before I came down here, I succeeded in locating the steam generator which powers this laboratory and closed the pressure regulator valve. A large head of steam will have built up inside it by now, Professor, and I think we would all be safer above ground. Shoot them, Horace. For heaven's sake, shoot them and let's be on our way. To hell with you, Sherlock Holmes. Let's get out! Clarissa! I can't! Stars in my eye! Holmes! Sorry, Watson! I've got it! Clarissa, help me! Wait! Help yourself! I've got it all! No, Clarissa, no! Not without me! He's killed her! You killed her! No, Holmes. I won't let you take me. 
There's nothing for me now. Holmes, he's going to... Oh! The fool's killed himself, too. Come along, Watson. Let's get out of this infernal place before it takes us with it into hell. Watson, you really must cheer up, you know. Forget about the whole business. Yes, Holmes, I must. It's no crime to be a charlatan. But this man was a cold-blooded killer, too. And so was the woman. Yes, Holmes, she was. She's the one that you're so preoccupied with, is she not? Well, not entirely, no. I, I, I mean, she was, I mean... Yes, Holmes, she is. She seemed so, at the beginning of it all, so sweet. She seemed to need me so much, but I suppose that was part of her act. Precisely. But tell me, at what point did you suspect that Smallbone might not have died? Well, I, I couldn't be certain, but there were a number of things. First, Watson, those patches on the wall, the missing pictures. They were pictures of Professor Smallbone, removed in case you should compare them to the face of the body in the laboratory. <sighs> then, of course, there was the business of the shaving equipment. Only a man who has a beard and wishes to remove it buys such things all at once. A clean-shaven man already owns them and merely pops up with the occasional item. But, but... Davy never mentioned that the real Smallbone had a beard. Why should he? He assumed that you'd seen the man and would already know. Well, I now know why she was so angry with me. She had no idea I shared lodgings with the famous Sherlock Holmes. She thought she'd found a fool to do her dirty work. Watson, my dear Watson, you are no fool. Clarissa Smallbone was a very clever woman, and what's sometimes just as dangerous, a very pretty one. Yes, it is a terrible waste. And no one will raise her from the dead. Let us hope not, Doctor. For both our sakes. In The Wandering Corpse, you heard Simon Callow as Sherlock Holmes, Nicky Henson as Dr. Watson, and Melinda Walker as Clarissa Smallbone. Mrs. Hudson was played by Jill Graham, Professor Smallbone by John Baddeley, Mrs. Aubrey by Geraldine Fitzgerald, and Professor Davy by Philip Anthony. The unopened casebook of Sherlock Holmes is written by John Taylor and directed by Peter Hutchings. <laughs>